here are universal. We all can relate to them because we all have them. They're very adaptive in some ways. So when you have anxiety, it helps motivate you to prepare for um, some sort of threat that's either in the near future or even more distant future. And right now, I think one could say we're all living under existential threats um, in terms of, first of all, we, the pandemic and at the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't know what we were dealing with um, and just to the state of the world right now and the uncertainty because with anxiety is usually triggered by uncertainty and and you know more now than ever I, that I can remember, it's kind of uncertain where things are going, where is inflation going, all sorts of nuclear uh, Armageddon, like lots of things are happening that we haven't actually had to confront for decades, probably. And so um, anxiety does have that adaptive quality. However, when things when the threat is ongoing or chronic, um, then and you don't get any relief from it, uh, anxiety can become more of a persistent problem and start to interfere with your life. And we'll, we'll talk about when do you go into that range. And then fear, uh, you know, people have fears, they're adapt us, adaptive, they protect us from doing dangerous things. Um, and, uh, you know, it encompasses that fight or flight reaction. So when you are um, confronted with an immediate threat, so if you were crossing the road and all of a sudden a car was coming right at you, your fear response, that fight or flight response would motivate you and mobilize your physiological resources to get out of the way very, very quickly. Or in the case of a situation where you had to defend yourself and in some cases freeze. So that fight, flight or freeze reaction. And we all do have that and it is adaptive. So we can all relate to some or not, if not all of these symptoms, symptoms of anxiety. And that was some of the questions that I was seeing is, well, how do I know this is anxiety? Anxiety um, and, and clinically, uh, clinical levels of anxiety, it's like a diagnosis of exclusion. You got to rule out anything medical because look at these symptoms. It's pretty much, you know, crosses everything like to feeling tense, keyed up on edge, having a racing or pounding heart, uh, feeling shaky. There's uh, cognitive symptoms, like feeling like you have difficulty concentrating, you can't uh, pay attention, you can't remember things, and that could be because you weren't concentrating to even take in information. Uh, it would it can affect your sleep. Uh, you can feel feelings of unreality, like your things are, are really strange around you, or you're detached from what's going on around you, you're in your head thinking about something that's making you anxious, or depersonalization, um, where you feel like you're just not, you're almost watching an interaction that you're in. Uh, those are very common. Uh, a number of the questions asked about, um, you know, abdominal GI type symptoms and anxiety and the gut, the gut um, microbiome, the gut response. And we know anxiety and fear are really connected in physiologically in that adrenaline fight or flight response to mobilizing, um, you know, your body that it does affect your gut, like it's almost directly related. And so when you're really anxious, you might have to go to the bathroom. Uh, you might have to go to the bathroom multiple times when you're um, anxious. And so um, absolutely, uh, you know, you can see those gastric symptoms and people who have chronic levels of anxiety often will go for investigations. Do I have irritable bowel syndrome? Like you can have both overlapping, of course, but anxiety can cause uh, people to feel like they have that and vice versa. So um that's important to know. Now, intense episodes of fear, uh, what we call panic attacks, I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. But, uh, you know, you all seem to know that you can have panic attacks in, uh, you know, across different types of anxiety disorders. Um, there's cognitive symptoms of anxiety, fearing that something bad is going to happen, uh, that you may lose control in some way, uh, you could pass out, um, you know, something bad may happen to you or your loved ones, uh, lots of cognitive worries. Um, and that, these words can seem uncontrollable, um, you know, and feels like catastrophes are going to happen. And we're going to talk a bit about the different types of uh, cognition or thoughts that people have when they're feeling anxious. And then uh, avoidance. So when people are anxious, they may start avoiding the situations or activities that are linked to the anxiety, because we're really smart. If we associate something with anxiety, you know, it's natural that we're going to want to avoid experiencing that. Now, panic attacks are, you know, here I have the symptoms here in this orange box. Uh, you know, many of the symptoms, all of the anxiety symptoms you can see in a panic attack. The actual definition is that you get a rush of these symptoms and they uh, peak within minutes. Uh, it's like a rush or a wave of fear that comes all across your body. And it's very, very intense. It's so intense, it's very scary. Many people think, what's wrong with me? Something's catastrophic. Maybe I'm dying. Maybe I'm having a heart attack. People quite often go to the emergency department to see, because they, they actually think there's something physiologically wrong, because often a panic attack will happen 
out of the blue when you weren't expecting it. And then you think, well, what's going on with me? Uh, and one study, uh, a community sample of over 10,000 people found that 22%, so more than one in five, um, almost a quarter of people had had a panic attack just at some point in their life. So panic attacks are very common um, and they can just happen here or there periodically, or they can become more of a problem. And we're going to talk about that as well. There was um, the Mental Health Commission of Canada has been doing these surveys throughout the pandemic. They're in the seventh or eighth wave of these surveys. Uh, the last um, survey was in January of this year, where they're just surveying how are people feeling during the pandemic, just general. Uh, and what they found is that a quarter, over a quarter of Canadians across the country report feeling mild to moderate anxiety and similar levels for uh, feelings of loneliness and depression, which is much higher than pre-pandemic. And it's not surprising because the pandemic has had all these um, kind of after effects. Um, you know, they, some people describe, um, you know, a, mental, a wave of mental health impacts from the pandemic. But we also see globally just sorts of the impacts to supply chains and gas and inflation and all sorts of things that you can imagine. Uh, it makes sense that we'd be feeling, you know, these uh, feelings. And what's interesting is almost a quarter of people wanted care, like they want to get help. How do I feel better or uh, get help with my coping, but we're unable to find or access services. So there's services out there, but people don't know what they are. And that system navigation is a real issue. And so we're going to talk about what are some options if you may be interested in knowing about services. And if people want to read that survey, there's a, a link there in the slide. So as I said, anxiety and fear are normal everyday experiences, um, but when do they cross out of the normal range? When might you think, gee, I think I gotta go talk to someone or get um, some help with this. And you know, there's some indicators of that. So if you feel that your anxiety is excessive given whatever the situation is, like right now, it's kind of normal to maybe feel a little bit uh, of unease just with what's happening in the world, or maybe you have a situation coming up where you're feeling anxious and it makes sense. Cause for example, you know, um, you know, my son had a test today. So yesterday he was, you know, to was tense, you know, stayed up late studying, was feeling anxious. But then today he wrote the test. He feels good. His anxiety has gone. So that's normal levels of anxiety. If someone had anxiety that's too much and they can't, um, you know, function, then that's, uh, you know, a sign that you might need some help. Does the anxiety reduce with rational explanation? So if someone's um, really afraid of a particular symptom, like I'm really worried, like, um, you know, my one son, he, you know, gets worried about a symptom, like I have this thing on my face, you know, what is this? And you explain, oh, no, that's just, a, you know, a normal blemish, and the anxiety goes away, then that's fine. But if it persists, despite rational explanation, then, you know, that may be a sign that it's moving into the clinical range. And as I mentioned, if it causes you a lot of distress, if you're worried about your worrying or you're, you're feeling like I'm so anxious, I, I can't enjoy my life. I can't, you know, if it starts for some people interfering with their ability to do go to work or go to school or do activities they like to do, if they stop socializing, um, that's also a sign. And then if the anxiety is persisting over time, like we may go through periods of life when there's more stress and you're feeling more anxious, but then it goes away. But if um, most of the anxiety disorders have a specifier of it, if it's persisting at least six months. And so if any of these apply to you or someone you love, that would be a time where we think, okay, you know what, it's, it makes sense maybe to go get this further investigated. And as I said, uh, you know, anxiety, we all experience it, but anxiety disorders, that clinical level anxiety is actually one of the most common mental health conditions. Um, however, even though it's most common, um, it's often under-recognized and under-treated. So even, you know, if people have it, they may not even know that, oh, this is what I'm experiencing. It's anxiety. It's an anxiety disorder. Or if they do, they may not know what treatments there are. And so the global prevalence um, based on a review of 80, across 87 studies in 44 countries found when they assess people right now in the current um, state, 0.9, so 1% to 28% of people were experiencing an anxiety disorder. And when they asked in your lifetime, have you ever had an anxiety disorder? Uh, it was uh, the, the numbers range from 2.4 to 29.8%. So uh, the prevalence rates are really high at the upper end. Like, it could be as high as almost one in three people have had an anxiety disorder at some point in their life. And it's across different cultures. Um, and that's what the countries show. It's not just unique to kind of a Western culture. Now, the syndromes may look a bit different depending on where a person's from and what's kind of normative in that country, but it is very universal. 
And when we talk about anxiety and anxiety disorders, there's no one anxiety disorder, and you'll see this huge list. There's actually lots of different anxiety disorders that you can have, so no wonder the prevalence rate's so high. Um, each of them have a lot of similarities, so all the anxiety disorders are characterized by those symptoms of anxiety, um, and for each person it's different what um, symptoms they experience. Uh, people also uh, may engage in avoidance behavior across all of these uh, anxiety disorders, and they also may engage in safety behaviors, which is various different behaviors they may do to help feel less anxious, whether that's checking behaviors, checking with loved ones, seeking reassurance about their worries, um, carrying certain things like always going out, um, you know, with a phone in case something happened to you. Um, now, everybody carries their cell phone these days, but you know, there's things that people may do, what we call safety behaviors to feel um, less anxious, but that they can actually um, maintain the anxiety disorder. Uh, so, each of these anxiety disorders, although they're similar and have uh, commonalities, they're all different in where the focus of fear is. Um, so what is the person particularly afraid of, whether it be a situation or a trigger, is what is, the for the most part, uh, a, the differentiating factor. So in specific phobia, people are afraid of a specific situation or trigger, like heights or seeing blood or flying in an airplane or driving, okay? So it's always, um, or it could be an animal, like a uh, phobia of dogs, storms, all different things. It could be really anything, but it's a very discreet fear. Um, whereas in social anxiety disorder, people are very um, you know, anxious about social situations where they may be negatively evaluated. So they may avoid a number of different situations or feel very comfortable because of that fear in social situations. They could do the situation if they're by themselves, but when other people are around or unfamiliar people, they may feel anxiety. In panic disorder, people are focused on the fear of the panic attack itself or panic symptoms. And it often goes hand in hand with agoraphobia, where people want to avoid situations where they may experience panic symptoms or panic attacks. In generalized anxiety, people are um, really uh, concerned about bad things that might happen, worries, worries about being in a car accident, worries about being late. It could be everyday worries, worries about not being able to pay the bills, even though that they have uh, they have enough money to do so, worry about bad things going to happen, and so on. So I'm not going to go through each one, but each of these anxiety disorders has a different focus of the person's uh, concern, and that's what distinguishes them. And um, up in the right there, you see the DSM-5, um, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. That's where we actually have the actual criteria for each of these disorders. And in the most recent edition, which is the fifth edition, obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, which are at the bottom there, were actually taken out of the anxiety disorder section and put in um, their own kind of chapters. So obsessive compulsive disorder is in uh, a chapter on its own with other uh, uh, different disorders that are more uh, impulsive, like hair pulling, which we call trichotillomania, and a couple other disorders, uh, more of impulse control. And post-traumatic stress disorder is in a chapter which really focuses on the fact that this disorder is really a response to external events. So you can't have post-traumatic stress disorder unless you've experienced a traumatic event and then you have a stress response. So just want to point those two out, but they're, they're really related to the anxiety disorders. Now, a number of questions uh, asked about, well, what about my loved one who has dementia or Alzheimer's and they're having a lot of anxiety? Uh, you know, what about, uh, you know, my, my loved one has, um, you know, been having heart, uh, you know, heart disease and is having anxiety or, you know, lots of questions about that. And I wanted to point out that anxiety can be, um, you know, represented as what we'd call secondary anxiety in, in relation to all sorts of different syndromes, whether they be, um, other mental health conditions. For example, people may have a syndrome called borderline personality disorder. There's a lot of anxiety present associated with that disorder or in eating disorder. People are anxious eating, um, you know, or related to their symptoms. Um, but that's, that's not an anxiety disorder in the ones that I just reviewed. It's just part of that other syndrome that they may be experiencing. Or with dementia and Alzheimer's, that may be uh, related to the, you know, changes in the brain uh, that are happening that cause anxiety. Um, or it may be for people think Alzheimer's, they may feel like they're they're aware that they're losing their memory and that makes them anxious. And it's what we would call secondary anxiety. Um, the treatments I'm presenting may help and may not help in those cases because the anxiety is caused by something else. Um, anxiety in the context of a terminal illness, for, for example. So in those cases, sure, there's anxiety, but we would be really conceptualizing it in the, in, in the context of what the primary 
uh, syndrome or condition is that we'd want to be focusing the treatment on. With this chart, I just really want to show you, you know, here's the prevalence rates for the lifetime for um, panic, agoraphobia, social anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, and phobia. And you can see when you add them all up, 33%. So that's where we get that one in three people will have had a anxiety disorder in their lifetime. So that's us or our family members, right? It's one in three. That's a really high number, which is why we got so much interest in this talk, I think, because people can really relate. Like I, I have a child with a lot of anxiety and I'm constantly uh, helping him manage that. Uh, you can also like, see here, what are the more common ones? So social anxiety and specific phobia are the most common um, anxiety disorders. Uh, you know, here's a slide showing prevalence in, in older adults. And um, what's interesting here is you can see it depends on the age. Uh, so age 55 to 64, the prevalence rate based on this study was about seven, jumps up to almost 14 at 65 to 74, and then back down to around 10 at 75 and above to 85. And you, and you wonder, well, what's going on there? Well, what's happening during 65 to 74? People are having a major life uh, transition. And I just want to point out that you always got to factor in stage uh, of life and, you know, what's happening in your life, um, you know, when we're, we're looking at anxiety, uh, because, you know, when you're having a transition like retirement or maybe someone's partner passes away, those types of things um, could trigger anxiety uh, later in life. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit about that actually based on people's questions. There's a lot of questions about uh, late life anxiety and anxiety in older adults. And so turning to that, we see that the community prevalence rates are about 3.5 to 10% uh, you know, of people, older adults may be experiencing anxiety. So it is lower than the general rates, um, but it, it's still not insignificant. And the studies find that in people who are homebound or in long-term care homes, hospitals, or who have a chronic medical condition, the rates are higher. The most common anxiety disorder in older adults is generalized anxiety disorder. So the worries and it, you know, you can kind of understand that when you think of all the things that are happening when, as you age, you know, your, your health is maybe deteriorating, loved ones may be ha having health problems or passing away, fin there's financial impacts, if there's, a, um, you know, no longer income coming in, there's, you know, all sorts of things. I could go on on another talk about that. Um, and clinically uh, significant anxiety symptoms are uh, even higher. So 15 to 20% in community samples um, and over 40% in individuals with disability or chronic um, illness. However, what was interesting was when I was looking at that study across Canada of what, how Canadians are doing during the pandemic, older adults actually fared much better than younger adults. So I thought that was very interesting and reported um, lower levels. Uh, you know, they still reported significant levels, but they weren't as high as, um, you know, people less than 65. So they reported having better mental health, strong, stronger coping skills, and were less likely to engage in problematic um, substance use. So that's, I thought that was interesting. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that anxiety is very highly comorbid with depression. They often go together. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Like they have a lot of overlapping symptoms. And also if you're very anxious, of course you're gonna get depressed. And if you're feeling depressed, it's often likely that you, know, you start getting anxious because of the different changes that you may be experiencing. Uh, here's just a case uh, of you know, what is happening to me. Jason uh, is a 58 year old man. He, was married, he is married with two children and he was out golfing one day when he started to feel strange. He felt anxious, like something bad was gonna happen. And it was hard for him to focus on his game or, you know, his uh, buddies were engaging in small talk. It was really hard for him to focus. Um, and he felt that rush of intense physical symptoms and he thought he was going to pass out. His heart was racing. He was sweating. He was shaky. He tried to push you, but his he head kept thinking, well, what's wrong with me? And on the ninth hole, he thought, this is it. Like something bad's going to happen. I have to go home. And when he got home, he felt much better. Uh, but he started to worry, well, what if that happens to me again? What if there's something wrong with me? And a few days later, a similar episode happened at work and he thought he would pass out. So he started to avoid social activities like golfing, going to his kid's hockey game for fear that he would become incapacitated. And he started to get a chronic level of anxiety all the time thinking, how am I going to feel this today? What's going to happen? Such that each day became like a struggle. And he really just felt like, will I ever be normal again? He found it difficult to concentrate, function at work, and eventually he went on a medical leave 
uh, his doctor investigate him to see, is there anything going on with you physically that may be accounting for these symptoms? But there was nothing abnormal in the medical assessment. And so Jason was referred to the specialized uh, anxiety clinic for assessment. I just wanted to point out, you know, this illustration of how panic disorder can start at age 58. Um, and he developed agoraphobia, like he stopped going in and engaging. And, um, you know, the good news is I'll come back to Jason with treatment, he made a full recovery. But I just wanted to say, show the how um, debilitating uh, this can be. And um, that's kind of a broad overview of anxiety, anxiety disorders. And now I'm going to turn to, well, what do we do when you have an anxiety disorder? And I really want to point out this really important um, resource, which is the Health Quality Ontario has actual um, a family and patient guide for what is anxiety and what do you do about it? What does good treatment look like based on evidence? And, um, and it goes through what are the standards of care that you should expect if you have, um, or you or your loved one have anxiety. And, you know, it goes through identifying and assessing it, um, getting support for the person and their family, a step care approach, meaning that we start with the lower intensity option and move to higher levels of intensity of treatment as needed based on the person's needs or preferences. Uh, then move to psychoeducation or self-help interventions, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute. A cognitive behavior therapy, which is the first line treatment for anxiety disorders, and also medication. So it's a really great resource um, and the links there for you. And now we're going to move to a, another poll. Thanks, Randy. Um, Shelly, do you want to put up the second poll? So a couple questions related to the next part of our talk. How familiar, how familiar are you with cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT? And then question two, another true false question. Family members may unintentionally reinforce and exacerbate their loved one's anxiety symptoms by engaging in accommodation behaviors, true or false? So we'll give you guys a few seconds to, to answer this poll. Just to let you know, I'm, I'm trying to answer some of the questions in the Q&A uh, during, the, during the presentation, and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll take some time at the, at the end of the talk uh, for Randy to answer some, some more of the questions that have come in. So that's, that's not bad in terms of uh, some familiarity. A lot of people have are somewhat familiar, um, but about half the people are not very familiar or not familiar at all. And, and uh, Randy's going to change that by the end of the talk. And uh, you, you, we're not fooling anyone with these true-false questions tonight. <laughs> this is a smart audience, Randy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so family can play a major role and not, of course, unintentionally in actually reinforcing and maintaining the uh, anxiety by um, engaging in various, uh, what we call symptom family accommodation, where if you have a loved one who has anxiety and maybe they check with you a lot and you give them information or reassurance, or maybe you, um, you know, I had one person who, um, you know, they had a fear of having an accident in their pants, like going pee in their pants. And so this was a, a teenager. And so the family would always, um, you know, stop five times on the way to a distance, like do all sorts of behaviors um, to accommodate her fear, which actually kept reinforcing it. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of that. That's an example of you can have a fear of anything and nothing would surprise me. And, uh, but family and being very well-meaning because when you're your loved one is upset. You want to do whatever you can to help um, reduce their distress, and that may inadvertently reinforce it. Like, and it's quite often avoidance. Um, you can see that in kids when they're going to school. Okay, you stay home today, uh, and then that starts a whole school <laughs> refusal thing that could, that's based in anxiety. So we're going to talk about what the treatment is for that. So moving on now. Here we go. And that's why uh, that guide is a family resource too, because it's really good for the family to know what is anxiety, what's the treatment, and how can I help. So um, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is a first-line treatment, as I mentioned. There's years, decades of research. There's thousands of studies now uh, across anxiety sort of showing its effectiveness. Uh, it's based on usually a treatment protocol that the therapist would be following session by session. Um, and uh, based on the specific anxiety disorder. However, there are transdiagnostic approaches too, that one protocol could treat a couple of different kinds because they do have those overlapping symptoms. 
Uh, what they do is really look at what is the person's thinking patterns and behaviors that are maybe contributing contributing to and maintaining the anxiety. So there's that idea of that interaction between the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that we then uh, look more closely at. And you want to have a professional who's trained in CBT uh, providing you that uh, that uh, um, treatment. Because uh, there may be people who say they do CBT because they went to a few workshops. But if I was going to get CBT and I, for my kid, I'd be, okay, where's a certified CBT therapist? And I have a resource. It's in the resource guide of how you find one. We have a list of uh, people certified across um, the country through the CACBT. And also feel free, if you were going to see a therapist, uh, to ask them, like, what is their training in CBT? Um, sessions vary in length. They're usually one to two hours. If in a group type uh, format of CBT, it would be two hours and one-on-one, -on -one, it would be one hour. Unless say in PTSD, sometimes we do 90 minute sessions and the typical duration is 12 to 15 sessions. Um, and sometimes we incorporate uh, family members for psychoeducation and how to support their loved one through the treatment. And it's, uh, CBT is a range of different strategies that are basically selected and put together as a package based on what the symptoms are. In older adults, it offers a really good alternative to medication treatment because when you're getting uh, older adults may be already taking a bunch of medications, may not want to add another one on board. And so CBT would be a good option to try. Um, however, if there are more medical conditions present, uh, it may uh, just be a complicating factor for some of the strategies, uh, for example, an exposure. Um, but uh, we know that it is more effective than no treatment or placebo. Uh, when someone thinks they're getting a medication, uh, it's actually a placebo medication. Uh, it's not a medication, it's a placebo, a sugar pill. Um, and uh, is CBT is more effective than that. Uh, however, there's very little research in this area, unfortunately. Um, so we don't know for sure. It is promising, but it may be less effective. So the effect may not be as strong or as robust in older adults. But I really do feel like if the, the jury's out, it's too early uh, you know, to say that for sure, because we the research is limited. We need more research on older adult populations. Now, here's the CBT model. Somebody asked, well, how do I, you know, get anxiety? Do, you know, does, is there a genetic factor? And, and here in these green boxes, you can see that there's all sorts of vulnerabilities that can predispose you to having an anxiety disorder, biological, whether that's, um, you know, your genetic, um, you know, background in terms of your, whether you have a heritability from family members who may have been anxious, like your mom or your dad. Um, so you can inherit, um, genes. They're not specific to specific anxiety disorders, but more general. So you may have an anxiety disorder different than your, your parent, but you know they're both in the anxiety realm. There's psychological vulnerability factors. So certain personality traits may increase your vulnerability. Um, you know, if someone is more uh, perfectionistic or they're higher in a trait we call anxiety sensitivity, where people are more sensitive to their physical sensations. Um, and then also social factors, you know, different things in your environment that may cause you a lot of, um, you know, challenge, um, you know, may increase your vulnerability to developing an anxiety disorder, uh, different events that happen, um, as I said, like traumatic events could trigger PTSD. And then there's learning experiences, the things that happened to you growing up or that you saw or that you learned from watching the news can also influence someone to develop uh, an anxiety disorder. For example, seeing a parent who's very fearful of snakes may um, transmit uh, phobia to their child. So that's one example. Um, and so you have these factors on board, and then often anxiety sort of start after or during a time of stress. And somebody asked about, well, what's the difference between stress and anxiety? Um, and, you know, they're very overlapping, uh, but, you know, stressful events can be positive or negative. You can uh, have, like, even, say, planning a wedding, which should be a positive event, can cause you stress. Um, and it can cause you a whole bunch of symptoms that look like anxiety. But once the stress is gone, the stressful event is over, you feel fine. So, um, you know, stress is your body's um, reaction to events that happen that could be positive or negative that disrupt your equilibrium. And in anxiety, people often come for treatment. They go, I, I have anxiety. I can't manage it. What should I do? And we really like to teach people, well, we can break down anxiety into these three components. What you think what you do when you're feeling anxious and how you're feeling in the body. And that's the very first step for us in helping people see, oh, you know, if I break this down, it's more manageable. And now that's how CBT works. We start to target each of those purple boxes there on the bottom. So for example, we think back to Jason who, um, you know, had the panic attack while he was golfing. You know, he had um, 
you know, we often use in CBT self-monitoring where we get people to record, you know, times they're anxious so we can start to really unpack what's happening. And he had an experience where he was at work. He was feeling um, hot and dizzy and he had the thought there must be something wrong with me. Something bad's going to happen. He actually left the office and thought in his head, he went out to his car and thought, I can't go back in there. And so his behavioral response was he started really, when he started feeling hot and dizzy, he started monitoring the more symptoms in his body. And guess what? If you monitor your body, you're going to find more symptoms. He escaped the situation by going out to his car. And guess what? When he escaped, the physical sensations of anxiety, depersonalization, derealization, racing heart that he was having reduced, and that reinforced him to avoid and want to not go back. And so we can see how by what happens with those thoughts and behaviors can amplify anxiety. And with CBT, we start to intervene there to actually reduce it. So we're changing up how people respond to the triggers. And so, as I mentioned, uh, CBT is a whole collection of different strategies um, with each one focusing on a different uh, target. So the very first step is psychoeducation. And you'll see in the resource, there's tons of different workbooks that we, you know, we've outlined there. Um, people, by really getting a good understanding of what's happening with their particular anxiety problem, they feel more equipped to how to, how to manage it. And so psychoeducation is a very good first start. And then we start focusing on those cognitive um, thoughts, those uh, thinking patterns, and try and reduce anxious thoughts and promote more balanced or different ways of responding to the, the trigger of the anxiety. And that also increases people's uh, belief in their ability to cope. The next thing we want to do is really tackle avoidance and, um, you know, using exposure strategies and that by people practicing being uh, of engaging in what they're afraid of, they actually start to build confidence and it reduces their anxiety. Uh, we also look at other coping skills, like some people may need social skills training or assertiveness training or maybe help with problem solving if they have a lot of worries but don't know how, how to effectively manage um, actual stressors that they may be facing. And finally, we do use relaxation-based strategies when people have too much anxiety that they can't engage in treatment. But for the most part, relaxation isn't really a core component of anxiety treatment. Most people who come to our clinic, they've already tried relaxation. It didn't help. And in fact, sometimes it makes it worse. They get what's called relaxation-based, uh, relaxation-induced anxiety. They're trying to relax and then they have uh, more anxiety. Uh, so those, that's a nice overview of the different strategies. And if we kind of target in more on the cognitive strategies, that self-monitoring, becoming more aware of what we're thinking, usually we're in autopilot, we're not thinking about our thinking, that's really key. Because once you start to look at how am I thinking, how am I responding, then you can start to identify and challenge these uh, thought patterns um, and consider other ways of thinking. It gives you a lot of control. In anxious thoughts, people are predicting some threat is going to happen. Now, if that was the only thing happening, they wouldn't get too anxious because they'd be like, oh, I think I can deal with it. You have to have that other piece to the equation where you feel like something bad is going to happen and I won't be able to deal with it. And so, um, and when it does happen, it will be really, really bad and I won't be able to deal with it. So I won't be able to cope. I won't be in control. And so there's those two parts to the equation there for anxious thoughts that we target in cognitive therapy. And the two common distortions we see in people's thinking patterns is something called probability overestimation, where people overestimate the chance of a bad thing happening. Um, like in social anxiety, people will think I'm an idiot. Well, people rarely, you know, that, that, that may be a much higher prediction than, than re really uh, the actual probability. However, even if it's true that someone did think you were an idiot, say you're doing a talk, say I'm doing a talk and someone thinks, oh, that person's crap. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say words like that if I'm being taped, I guess. <laughs> Actually, um, but anyway, but then you say, so what? You can't please everybody, right? So how do you respond and in your mind think when you're having these anxious thoughts? Uh, and that goes to the catastrophic thinking, overestimating how bad a particular outcome would be. So if someone, if someone doesn't like my talk, is it really that bad? How awful will it be? Could I manage? So that's what we're doing when we're doing cognitive therapy. Uh, we're really trying to look at, um, you know, different ways of thinking, whether it's looking at the evidence, gathering evidence, considering other perspectives for the trigger, um, and also modifying the perceived cost. Like, you know, how would you uh, cope in that situation? And would it really be that bad? What would you say to a friend who is having a thought like that? So really getting people out of their head and stepping back to examine their thinking. And I do it all the time. Uh, that's how I, uh, I keep going is I do uh, cognitive therapy on myself. That's the advantage of being 
my uh, psychologist. Okay, moving on to behavioral strategies. Uh, so, you know, it's really sad, but it's true. You cannot go get over a fear by just sitting in a room talking about it. You actually have to go out and actually confront what it is you're afraid of. And people are like, I don't want to do that. Uh, and that, that avoidance is what maintains it. But what we try and do, so that's called exposure. And we try and do it in a really gradual way where it's all fully in the person's control, uh, really stepwise. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of how we do that. And, um, and we also, at the same time, try to reduce those safety behaviors, like no longer checking with uh, people for reassurance or, you know, someone's afraid of driving on the highway, uh, only going during um, non-busy times, that sort of thing. And then we also may use behavioral experiments, like where someone could go test out one of their anxious thoughts, uh, maybe they have an anxious belief, and see if, if what they're predicting would happen really does happen. Uh, so they gather new evidence. So in exposure, we're really identifying the triggers uh, that uh, what are the things that people are avoiding because of their anxiety, and then in a gradual controlled way, get them to practice being in those situations using what we call uh, an exposure hierarchy, which is a list of the situations from organized from lower anxiety levels to high. So you can see for Jason playing around of golf with his friends, putting him back in that kind of really initial situation that triggered the panic or where he experiences first panic attack was a hundred anxiety on his exposure hierarchy. We're not starting there. We're starting at the bottom, go to the driving range. When he thought about going to the driving range, his anxiety was a 40 because he could leave easy, he was by himself. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of different situations there that as he uh, practiced uh, each one, the remaining ones uh, reduced and he started to get his confidence back. So in about 15 sessions of CBT, Jason was back to work. Um, it was a real and feeling and he's back, um, you know, golfing and doing all sorts of things that he had stopped doing because of his panic attacks. That doesn't mean we completely eliminated the panic. It's just it wasn't interfering with his life anymore. He knew how to manage it because that's the thing. People often when they come for treatment, they say, I want to get rid of this anxiety. It may not be that. Anxiety may ebb and flow, especially if you have a lot more biological vulnerability to it. And so then how do you manage it? So you're controlling it and it's not controlling you. And we have some guidelines and how people uh, practice the exposure. And the more you practice, uh, the quicker it goes. Um, and I wanted to just, uh, you know, I see the time. I'm going to just go a little quicker here. Uh, CBT, although it's great, isn't for everybody. Uh, not everybody responds to CBT. Not everybody wants CBT. It's it's work. It's like if you're doing piano lessons and you don't practice in between the sessions, it's not going to work for you. So you actually have to practice the strategies. And some people just want to talk about why do I have this anxiety? Where did this come from? They just want to talk or get support. And that's fine. That probably is not going to fix the anxiety, but some people don't want the CBT. And then they may want to consider other types of options. I'm not saying there's other Treat, there, there could be other treatments that could be available, but the first line treatment of CBT may not be for them. And so you have to be motivated. Um, you know, the person has to, you know, be ready to engage. And, and sometimes it's the timing of it. You know, maybe they're not ready now, maybe at a different point. So I just wanted to point that out that it's not like we get 100% treatment response in trials. It depends on the disorder. With a phobia and CBT, we almost have 100% remission. Uh, you know, whereas, uh, say, OCD, it's a lot lower, it's much more persistent, people get significant improvement, but we may not be fully, you know, uh, curing the disorder. How do I get CBT? The very, a good place to start is your family doctor, because they know the referral options in your area. Uh, there's also self-directed CBT using a workbook, and we have a whole bunch in the resource list. And there's private CBT in your community. So through psych psychologists or social workers or different private psychotherapists. And then you can, as I mentioned, there's a resource where you can find people who are trained in CBT uh, through the CACBT website, which we have also on the resource page. Now, in the self-help uh, category, uh, we have, you know, that's where you work on it on your own and you start to empower yourself to feel like, okay, I'm going to try out these strategies. And that could be guided with using a coach or unguided. Um, there's also apps that can do that can help you with that. Uh, here I just showed us, uh, you know, a few different workbooks and on the resource list, there's a whole bunch more, but you can go now and there's there's workbooks for every particular type of anxiety problem. It's better to get a workbook that's specific to what your fear is, because that's just going to be more tailored, even though there are more general ones like, um, you know, the anti-anxiety workbook here, you can see is more general on the CBT strategies. There's workbooks for kids and teens, which we also have in the resource um, list. 
as well as a bunch of different websites that provide um, the low intensity options that you can check out and are in your resource list. And I mentioned there's there's mobile apps that can be helpful that, um, you know, some are for a fee and some are free. Uh, someone had asked about mindfulness and whether mindfulness is part of CBT or compatible. Uh, mindfulness, uh, you know, which for people who are not sure, you know, maybe not as familiar, although most people are familiar with it now, um, is just a way of being in the moment and a way of um, interacting with the world where you're being more observing, non-judgmental. There, it could be a way of interacting and being in yourself, or it can also be a meditation uh, where you actually do a mindfulness meditation, a style of meditation. Uh, there's apps called Headspace and Calm that lead you through those meditations and people can find it very relaxing. It can help them step back from anxiety symptoms. Um, you know, we still, the evidence, you know, is showing that mindfulness has promise for treating anxiety. Right now it's been used mostly after people have tried CBT and, um, you know, it's gotten them some symptom improvement, but they want to try something else to maybe augment it. So we just did a trial where we looked at mindfulness for OCD after people had had CBT and it did help them get further treatment gains. Um, mindfulness has also been uh, combined with cognitive therapy for uh, an intervention um, that's been effective for preventing relapse and depression and is also starting to be more and more uh, researched in anxiety. So it's definitely something I think if it was me or my family member, I'd want to start with CBT, but it certainly doesn't uh, hurt to have some mindfulness and especially for relaxation, um, you know, is a good strategy. Uh, Internet-based CBT, where you, you know, they have, uh, you know, different programs that use a coach or a trained therapist. Um, and in Ontario, it's free through the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program. However, there are other programs that may charge a fee, and we have some listed on the resource. I just want to spend a minute, just uh, the last minute here, talking about the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program. Now, I don't know how many of the 743 people on this uh, webinar are in Ontario, but if you are, the amazing thing is uh, the Ontario government has started funding CBT, um, and the website is there. Uh, both for the West region, which is if you live anywhere uh, kind of all the way to London, Tobermory, uh, Hamilton, that's the Ontario West region, or even Toronto or north of Toronto or east Ottawa, the, these two web links will take you to all the sites that are providing, um, you know, OHIP covered CBT. They have, most people start with the low intensity, it's called bounce back, and then it can up level to uh, ICBT and, and even one-to-one -one CBT uh, with a mental health uh, clinician. That's all covered by the government. And it's for people with, who are 18 and over with mild to moderate symptoms of any of those anxiety disorders and depression. So that's a really exciting thing that's been happening um, and actually just rolled out in our region, but it's rolling out all over the province right now. It's getting up and going. So I wanted to um, just wrap up there. And uh, just this is just the summary that, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, from, from this evening, you are appreciating how prevalent anxiety disorders are. And even if you don't have symptoms of an actual anxiety disorder, having chronic symptoms that um, what we call subclinical symptoms can be very distressing and impairing pairing and may warrant attention. And that's where that guide um, that can be really helpful in, in helping you know where to start. And CBT um, could be a really great option um, if uh, that's something that you want to consider. So now I think we have time for, um, yeah, we have 10 minutes or so or a little more for questions. Yeah, so that was that was excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Randy. Uh, I, I've been doing my best to try to respond in writing to some of the Q and A uh, that have been posted, but um, let's try to get through as many of them uh, as we can. Uh, so the first uh, question is: that I've developed severe anxiety since the tragic passing of my best friend to a murder, and developed great sense of fear as a result. Terrible loneliness. Uh, can you suggest or recommend a particular treatment? And I think one thing that was highlighted in the chat, and as we answer some of the questions, I think we'll we'll try to make them more general, teachable moments uh, rather than sort of uh, medical or psychological uh, treatment advice. So, um, you know, I guess maybe thinking about something like this, where there's been a a, a tragic event like this, and um, challenging challenges emotionally afterwards yeah and so you know I mean so sorry for your loss that is you know such a terrible terrible thing to have happen and 
generally when very bad things and we none of us make it through life without bad things happening traumatic events actually have a high prevalence rate um and uh you know if you know and it's there's a natural process of responding and feeling anxious and lonely and grief that's that's normal uh to experience after you've had a traumatic experience and usually uh you know within one to three months people's symptoms may resolve uh, but if you are finding uh you know even after four weeks or if it's really interfering with your ability to just live your life that it's worth then going to get some help for it and um you know people can develop post-traumatic stress uh disorder which is where they you know have all sorts of thoughts it can interfere with their um you know sleep um re-experiencing symptoms thinking about things over and over again um so grief and loss are commonly associated with that and so um you know that osp program uh would be a good program for ptsd like or symptoms like that anxiety after grief and loss uh going to your family doctor or um you know looking at kind of what are some of those programs online um or get having seeing a, a private therapist so i think that that you know can really help people get through after um experiencing really traumatic events and there's also support groups that can be very helpful um sometimes feel like being with people who've also experienced similar things is a source of comfort. That's excellent. Um, how do you identify whether you're depressed or have an anxiety disorder? Yeah, and so um, often, as I said, you may have both. Uh, so about 50% of people actually do have both. They kind of go hand in hand. Depression is really characterized by feeling very sad, down, hopelessness, withdrawing from doing things and can often happen after anxiety or vice versa. And so, um, you know, I think that the first step, like, you know, really identifying, are you not enjoying things anymore? Are you feeling hopeless about the future? Do you feel like you're thinking more negatively about the world um, or about yourself? Any of those types of kind of signs may be suggest suggestive of um, symptoms of depression. And so starting with the family doctor or any of those resources um, might be helpful because the workbooks and there's workbooks for anxiety and depression, they go over those symptoms and you can see, oh, does that resonate with me? Does that sound like what I'm experiencing? And then you can see that there's really good strategies for depression, just like we have for anxiety. CBT can be very effective. It's a first line treatment for depression as well. I think one of, one of the things that we see clinically as well is that many people suffer with anxiety disorders for many years, and the and the first time they go to see their doctor about it is if they've had a depression superimposed on top of it. So it's good that they're seeking help, and it's good, and hopefully the depression gets treated. But if the underlying anxiety disorder is not assessed and recognized and treated, they will also be at higher risk for recurrence. So um, important to you know try to talk to your doctor if you feel like, hey, I have underlying anxiety symptoms, even if the it's led to a depression. So. Yeah, and I think that's a good point because there's stigma. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I feel embarrassed to go talk about anxiety. Um, I had a person who had a fear, a phobia of pigeons that was so uh, interfering. She actually didn't travel for jobs because she could go have to go to places where there's pigeons until she saw an Oprah session on treating phobias and then she came forward. So I think recognizing that we all experience it, it's universal, can hopefully um, make people more comfortable to go in and talk to uh, people around you to try and see, well, where where's the help for that? There's a couple of questions um, related to other types of therapies. Um, how, for example, does CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, compare to DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. So CBT is kind of like a big umbrella and you could package pretty much any a, a treatment strategy can fit under CBT. Um, if you're targeting people's thoughts and behaviors and DBT, which was developed by Marshall Linehan, is a form of CBT. It's just a particular treatment package of strategies, but it's based on strategies that target uh, cognition, behavioral strategies. It's actually very behavioral. And the main focus of DBT is emotion regulation. And it's one of the um, treatments that are used for people who are having borderline personality disorder or other syndromes where they're having their emotions like really feeling dysregulated. It's hard to control the emotions. They may feel like um, hurting themselves to, as a way of controlling emotions or feeling turning feelings off. Um, so DBT is uh, kind of it's sometimes referred to the a third wave CBT, um, but you know any of those can be packaged um, under that CBT umbrella. That's great. There there are so many great questions. We'll 
We'll perhaps go a few minutes over to try yeah, to I'm address. I'm happy to go over. To, to, uh, I'm excited by the question. So let's go. <laughs> let's go for so it. here's a great one. It's, uh, this person started having panic attacks while being a passenger in a car and can no longer travel on major highways and doesn't feel comfortable driving on highways. Is this? Do you feel that this person would be able to drive again after CBT? Absolutely. So yeah, you know what, this is a common one we see, um, you know, people, when you have a panic attack, whatever you're doing, when you have that panic attack, it's going to be hard to do. And so and as you see with um, what you're describing, um, anxiety tends to, um, you know, generalize, oh, I can't do that. Now, now I'm having trouble this highway. And now because I avoided those highways, I'm having trouble with even smaller highways and it starts to snowball. Uh, the avoidance starts to snowball. So absolutely driving phobia or people who are having trouble driving on highways, what we do is we build that exposure hierarchy. We often in, uh, get involved a loved one who can help by first we start maybe the person's a passenger in the car or maybe they start practicing. Maybe we start on a, a a highway that's not as scary, uh, that's less crowded, and we move up the hierarchy. But we treat lots of people with driving phobias, bridge phobias. A lot of people who live near Hamilton have a fear of the the Skyway. I the don't skyway even like bridge. The Skyway. <laughs> I don't even like it. So and there's another one on the way to Niagara that's terrible. But anyways, absolutely, um, that can be tackled. It's you know. It takes work and practice. And um, like I said, having the loved one, but the therapist will often go right in the car and will be in the back seat while the, the a family member or partner is helping with the exposures as well. And then between sessions, the person goes drives with the family member or a friend who's helping support the exposures. And it's stepwise. So you do it gradually. How can we convince, in quotes, convince loved ones that they have uh, some form of anxiety or an anxiety disorder? Is it something that people should be self-aware of or not really? Well, that's a doozy. That's a loaded one. We can <laughs> see a lot of times we can see our loved one has a problem, but if you try and broach that, they may not be open to it at all. So, I mean, I think it depends on the situation, the context, they may get defensive. They may not like it. I think if you think the loved one has a anxiety, just checking in with them in a way that asks them, you know, Hey, I, I noticed that you know, you seem to be uncomfortable. Are you feeling anxious or disclosing your own anxiety might help them express themselves. But, you know, for some people, um, you may be able to see it. And even if they may not a acknowledge it or B want to treat it, and then there's nothing you can do. We've had lots of family members want to bring people for treatment. The person doesn't want treatment. And unfortunately, and sometimes that's like an 18 year old and you're the parent. And if they don't want to engage in treatment, um, it's very hard to sit by and have your loved ones suffer, but ultimately they, people have to want to come for treatment and, and, and participate. Here's another one. How can someone deal with the anxiety of the unknown, such as uh, pregnancy or the, for example, the delivery of the baby or health of the baby? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, anxiety in some senses is all about the unknown and the uncertainty. And in fact, we have quite often people have, we have uncertainty in all areas of our life, but people will zone in on one particular area. Like in this case, it's like pregnancy. And that's often a, a, a feared uh, time for people and can be very interfering. Um, I've even seen people who didn't want to get pregnant because they were, had lots of worries about outcomes and bad things happening. And we would use the same approach, start to tackle, well, Let's try and make see what are the predictions that are being made and start to tap into those anxious thoughts. And then how do we counteract them so that the person can, can actually start to consider, okay, well, what's another way to look at this? How do I challenge these anxious thoughts and feel um, more comfortable? So we would use the same strategies um, and just really try and monitor what the actual fears are. And often people will say, you know, say, well, you know, very broad fears and we want to get very specific. Well, what actually could happen? Let's go through each of your fears and really unpack it. Yeah, that, that concept of anticipatory anxiety is such an important one in anxiety disorders isn't it exactly um, we haven't we have we haven't had a lot of questions about medications there is a medication question here this is a person on an older type of anti-anxiety medication clonazepam which is a type of benzodiazepine and they only take it occasionally on an as needed basis. They find it very effective for reducing and managing anxiety. And then as, as a result, they're reluctant to try anything new. Um, so thoughts on this, I guess what we could say is there are just like CBT is a very effective treatment for um, anxiety disorders. There are also some effective medications um, and 
some of the most commonly prescribed medications like clonazepam or benzodiazepines are probably over prescribed for anxiety. They're actually no longer the first line treatments, but they continue to be the most commonly prescribed. They can be useful in the short term while starting somebody on another medication or if they're uh, so impaired that they can't participate in something like CBT. Um, but there are a lot of potential side effects. And so uh, I would say very important to discuss this with your doctor if the decision is made to, uh, to switch to medications or to use, uh, you know, one of the, the first line medications, which are mostly in the family of SSRI medications. But, you know, there are a lot of people in your position that are that are on uh, an older uh, drug or a benzodiazepine. And I think, especially in older adults as well, we do see a wide range of, of side effects in terms of effects on balance or cognition. So I don't know if you have any other comments on that. Yeah. And, you know, we have used, there's trials out there using CBT to help people come off of those yeah. medications. So you can actually, um, and they, it's very effective because people become, you also develop a psychological dependency on the medication you think I can't get better without this I'll have anxiety if I come off and there's also rebound anxiety people get anxiety when they come off the medication yeah. and CBT can be a really useful um, treatment to help someone reduce on on that medication maybe come off completely have a course of CBT to see if that's helpful and if and if it's still persisting then add in uh, one of the newer medications great point does child separation anxiety factor in here? This is a, a case of a, a younger child, a four-year-old boy who doesn't want to go uh, to Sunday school in this. In this oh, okay. Yeah. You know, some like it, it's really important to consider the stage because kids maybe naturally have some separation anxiety at various different stages. And some kids maybe it's, they're a little more anxious with newer situations than others. So it also depends on the child and their personality. And, um, but CBT can be really a, a good approach. It's the same treatment that we use uh, for kids in terms of helping to just break it down and get them more comfortable. And so how do you help uh, for that child make it more fun, pair it with something like, you know, my own child was nervous to get on the bus and I would, uh, you know, just say, oh, well, we're, no, we're going on the bus for school, but I would be giving them Oreos and just trying to make it fun and help break it down. Um, you know, like talk, I would talk to the bus driver, to, you know, so she could give them extra support. So can you go visit the classroom Sunday schools in with your kid, have some Oreos or something, you know what I mean? How can you get the person, the kid more comfortable in whatever that situation is and really use a hierarchy. You can break it down into little steps that then, and then maybe it's going with them, or maybe they have a little buddy you can pair them up with so they feel more comfortable. So you can think of how do we take this scary situation where I'm not with my parent in this big room of people I don't know, and then make it much more comfortable um, for the, the person. But uh, lots of kids, especially certain kids have harder times with transition and new things, but you can use these same strategies to tackle it. And we just adjust them accordingly, depending on how old the child is, uh, you know, in terms of how we talk about anxiety, like scary thoughts, um, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, it, here's another great question. How do you know when medication should be used? Should it be at the same time as CBT or should CBT be done first? And uh, which medications are best to start for young adults or late teens? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. Like, ideally, you don't want to start two interventions at the same time because you don't know, well, which one's working, okay? And so I think it really requires get going to your doctor and knowing what are the pros and cons of medication? What are the pros and cons of CBT? I can't really think of many cons other than it does require work and time. And especially if someone can't even go to school or like function, like that's when you may think, okay, if they can't even engage in treatment because they're so anxious, sometimes we see people so distressed they can't even engage in the treatment or monitor the thoughts, then medication may be considered. So I think really thinking of what the advantages or disadvantages of each approach, and then you start one and then give it a full trial. Like it takes a certain amount of time for a medication to work, see if it's working. And then you can add in the other treatment if it's not working. Like with CBT, we want to give it a full test to see, you know, you know, like I said, it's 10 to 12 sessions. Well, let's give you a full dose and then see like, where's your level at? Is it reduced? Is it manageable? Or is it still very high and then you want to consider maybe going on a medication. 
I think some of the other questions that people have had to kind of relate to access to CBT. So one question was, what's the, the average cost of a CBT session? And then another question was, what's available in Ontario for under 18s? We're, yeah, we're that's a great question. point, because I think access like I mean, one upside of the pandemic, if you could think of an upside is the ability to do virtual treatment, which makes it you can access it anywhere. Now, in Ontario, it's free. Other places, it may not be. So there is a cost potentially or it depends on what services are available in your area. And that's why asking your family doctor, they usually know what resources are in the local area. Um, the government covered CBT right now is for people 18 and up. They will be bringing in um, treatment for for younger child and youth, but it's downstream. So it's really about looking at where um, in your community is CBT offered. Uh, most communities would have CBT programs for kids and youth. Um, like in Hamilton, all those referrals go through a place called uh, Contact Hamilton. Uh, but whatever your local area is, starting with the family doctor, again, I know I keep saying that, but they know what, what the resources are, but that, that should be accessible. And then also there's those workbooks I mentioned. It's a good place for parents to start. So uh, because as a parent, I know from my own child, my child has OCD, right from when he was five, we were working on it at home and, and the strategies, and it's helped him manage it so it doesn't interfere. The for the Ontario structured psychotherapy, does it have to be referred by a family physician? No, you can call or uh, yourself. Like I think there's that web form, uh, like that the link would take you to a, a web form. But I'm pretty sure people can can go access it themselves. So there's another question here that's interesting: is is some anxiety caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, and are there cases where only medication will help? Yeah, that's a great question. We do know that there's alterations in your brain when you're experiencing anxiety, alterations of neurotransmitters. Uh, that's the mechanism that, you know, when we're taking SSRIs, it's changing, you know, your receptivity to, you know, neurotransmitters um, and your uptake. So uh, that's what they're called, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So we do know there, there is imbalances per se, um, but, uh, what was the second part of that question? <laughs> just it, it, it is, I guess the answer is just because there may be chemical imbalances or genetic factors does not mean that CBT or psychological oh. therapies won't work. Because yeah. I think the implication here was, oh, the chemicals are imbalanced. So you need a medication, that's right. but, yeah. but that's actually not the case. Yeah. yeah, because even stressful life events can trigger your your you to get imbalanced, right? Yeah. So like that's like the stress chemicals. So um, yeah, so absolutely. And in fact, there's a really cool study, actually it's in depression, which compared um, a medication treatment and um, a CBT, and they looked pre-post at the brain changes and the CBT, both the, the brain changes were there, whether you had CBT or medication, they were in different places. The people got better from their depression and both um, interventions targeted uh, changes in the brain, but actually in different brain areas, uh, which was really cool because yeah, you can change your brain as you're changing how you think and behave. You're also changing yeah. your brain. When we, when we learn something new, our brain chemistry changes and similar studies, I think in OCD have shown pre and post psychotherapy or medication changes with cognitive behavioral therapy on brain imaging. So exactly. you, you can change your brain with psychotherapy as well. 